Hi, Army. Um, thanks for um, sparing some time today. It's great to actually finally meet you. Um, if you could maybe give us a background about yourself so the guys can get to know you. Sure. My name is Army Leg. I live in Virginia in the United States. I am a writer and an entrepreneur. And I have a website called improvism.com where I try to help people who are very obsessed with their health and fitness simplify their health, fitness, and productivity. Excellent. Um, what I'll do at the end as well is put Army's uh, website because it is excellent. You've got some great people on your podcast and I really enjoy your, your blog post as well. And uh, so there's some great content there. Thanks. Uh, I just want to put that up. Um, right, so I thought um, today it would be quite good to look at um, the mindset of working with different client populations. So I was thinking to, my, to myself and I was thinking, what's, what, have, what have I not seen out there at the moment? I thought what would be quite cool is to look at um, the different um, population in terms of physique competitors and obese individuals or obese population. And specifically looking at the behavioural characteristics and how you would uh, adapt nutrition and training to... Um, ensure like um, long-term adherence and getting successful results so I thought, sounds great man if we could look at that um, so if we could start off with more of the behavioral characteristics and what you would face working with both a physique um, competitor and obese population so I don't know how you want to quite work out if you want to look at one particularly first or compare sure well let's talk about obese people first because that's you know there are more obese people than there are figure competitors mm -hmm. so obese people the main issue oh there are a lot of issues they're facing but in terms of behavioral problems that they might be dealing with a lot of it comes down to understanding how much they're eating and moving a lot of people overestimate how much they are exercising and underestimate how much they are eating in terms of calories and a lot of cases uh, in most cases I, I believe it's around 3,900 calories per day is the average uh, that an American eats, which is a lot of food. So in a lot of cases, even a few small changes are enough to help them bring that down to cause pretty significant and fast weight loss, just eliminating caloric drinks or just soda even in some cases. So in a, from a behavioral perspective, what you want to do is make it as easy as possible for them to adopt their diet. So probably the biggest mistake these people make is assuming that unless they are hungry, unless they are making some massive change to their diet, that they are not going to be able to lose weight. And on the other end, you have people who just have no idea what they're doing, um, you know, about food quality or quantity or anything. So in those cases, it's best to just sit down with the person, look at what they're eating on a daily basis, you know, have them write down their food in a food journal for a few days. At this point, you don't even have to have them track calories. Just have them write down what they're eating. Then you can look it over and just make a few tweaks, you know, eliminating this or, you know, ask them, you know, did, when you had this bag of potato chips in the afternoon, were you really hungry or were you just, you know, kind of bored? It's like, well, I was bored. And say, okay, so what else can you do during that? And just making very small tweaks so they barely even notice it. And it works very well because they don't notice it. Um, so I guess, you know, that is a pretty good way to start it off with the obese people. For the figure competitors and people who are very obsessive, people who are highly motivated, they often run into the same problems, but for different reasons. So they generally, they don't need to lose as much fat, but they are so determined to do so mm -hmm. that they often screw themselves because they set extremely high expectations for themselves. And if they don't follow their diets exactly, they often feel completely defeated. They feel like they've failed. And so what you want to do is take a more flexible approach with those people. You still obviously set high goals. You know, getting down to 5% body fat for a guy or 8 or 10% for a girl is low. It's hard. So those are still ambitious goals. But what you do is you still take a more flexible approach. So you still let them eat the foods they want. You let them, you know, have days where they don't necessarily have to stick to their diet or eat within their calorie goals. You let them eat a little more. And it's not a big deal. Because over the long term, you're keeping your perspective. So for very obsessive people, it's generally being a little too perfectionistic and absolute in their diets. For obese people, it's often more of awareness, just being aware of how much they are eating and moving and making very small changes to keep progress moving forward. Excellent. 
you've sort of answered the second part of the question. Um, <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> no, that's good. That's good. That's excellent. Um, this was actually from my fellow online coach, Daniel Group. So, hi, right, Dan. Cheers for the questions. Um, he said, what are uh, the main problems you would experience within uh, working with obese and physique competitive populations in terms of their weight loss approaches? She said about like the phys- physique competitors and their obsessiveness and uh, already. So maybe what are the most common things you find in terms of why it's not as successful over the long term? Because people tend to lose the weight. They go re- ultra quick, cut calories, exercise six times a week, do a ton of cardio. And then all of a sudden it's like, I can't keep this up and it just goes all back on. So what's, I mean, that's one common thing is there. Any other ones you can think of? Sure. Well, in general, a lot of the problems faced by both obese people and very lean competitive people or you know, people who are pushing the limits of body composition are similar. So in, they both often try to do more than is really necessary up front. They both, as you said, they'll exercise more than they really need to to cause fat loss. And they get, they often assume that the rate of progress they have at the beginning of their diet is going to continue. So just being, a, helping these people understand that that's not how it's going to work can be very empowering because they're like, okay, I know, you know, it's really cool. I'm losing like two pounds a week right now. This is awesome. But I know that in a month or two, it's going to be less and I'm okay with that. Um, so... Often setting realistic expectations up front is very smart and just educating the person about what they're going to deal with. And that's true for both populations. Um, with obese people, you know, let's say they, you know, both groups have lost weight. The obese people, the biggest thing is adherence. So they, you know, they, let's say you put them on a slight, you give them some macronutrient targets, they're eating on the lower carb end of things, and they just get bored with it. And they're like, oh, this diet sucks, I'm tired of it, you know, and they just kind of slowly start eating other junk. And because they don't have any other real kind of structure, it's very easy to lapse back to old behaviors. And so what you can do to help prevent that is, number one, setting up a diet from the beginning that they enjoy. So not just telling them, you're going to eat low carb because that's what you should do because you're overweight. It's just, you know, what do you enjoy? What type of diet do you like to eat? And then going from there as opposed to trying to fit them into whatever system you normally use. The second thing is to allow them breaks, allow them diet breaks. You have, you know, you structure a few meals per week where they're allowed to go out with friends and have something that's not specifically or normally on their diet. You allow them to have even a whole day where they, they're not, it's not a cheat day. They're not trying to like cram a bunch of crap down their throats, but they're just, you know, they're allowed to go out and have breakfast at Cracker Barrel or wherever, you know, whatever restaurant and like just not worry about it. And yes, over at first that often doesn't produce the same kind of results as a crash diet, but they can maintain it, and that's the important thing. The same thing actually goes for the other population, the physique competitors and everybody else. In that case, what they all, adherence is still the biggest issue, but it's for different reasons. In that case, it's not as much because they get bored with their diet. Um, well, they do get bored with it, but they can, they can suffer more, basically, than the uh, <laughs> other population. And they're going to have to because they have higher goals. But what often happens is they they push it too far. They suffer a lot. They are just miserable with their diets. And then they end up binging, which is probably the most common reason that you know very highly motivated people don't necessarily reach their physique goals as quickly as they'd like. And you know, a lot of people don't really realize this, but binge eating is way more common among physique sports than most people realize. It's rare for a bodybuilder to prepare for a contest and not binge afterwards or even during um, or leading, leading up to the contest. So in that case, again, the biggest thing is allowing them to be flexible. You're not suppressing all these cravings for months at a time and then just going overboard with it afterwards. You're letting them indulge in this stuff throughout the whole process. And yeah, they're still probably going to have some urges to binge every now and then, but they'll be controllable versus uncontrollable. So. Again, those are probably the two best approaches. Um, or if, For both populations, really, the approach is setting up a system that they enjoy from the beginning and allowing some flexibility within that system as you get closer to your goal. Excellent. I'm, um, in terms of when I set up, like, I, I don't like the word diet because people tend to associate diet with all the fad diets. So when um, working with clients, I give them like their nutrition plan and take into account the foods they like. Um, and then the, my view is, if you get the plan and you feel that you won't be able to do this for the long term, you, then it's not the right plan for that person. 
and sure. it's been able to adapt to that. Um, in terms of like the binge eating, would you find um, like we've got the whole clean eaters and the old if it fits your macros? Um, if you have a, which I don't, don't know if there's much, but there's probably not any research out there. But in terms of the clean eaters, would you say they'd be more likely to binge during and especially post competition due to the fact that they've said these foods are off limit? And after post competition, they're gonna more likely binge because of that. Yeah, I would say in general, people who place very strict rules on themselves about what they can and can't eat are more likely to binge. But to be fair, um, I think it is also very common, even in the if it fit, uh, if it fits your macros camp as well, because while they aren't restricting the quality of their food, they are being very strict about how much they eat. But again, that's true for anybody who's competing in this stuff. It's not like it's an either or type of thing. Mm -hmm. But either way, the tendency and the urge is still going to be there. But I think people who allow themselves to have foods, you know, whether or not they're considered clean, are less likely to binge after these contests. And I think most, pretty much all figure coaches would probably agree with that to a certain extent. Cool. Um, from a goal setting and progress monitoring perspective, how would these differ between the both populations? For goal setting, so do you mean how would you set up a goal based on these two populations? Is that the question? Yeah, and sort of how you would monitor their progress for that in terms of, um, so an example would be how often they weigh themselves, um, uh, sort of stuff like that. So how, how would you pr look at setting specific goals? So you've already mentioned in terms of diabetes population just sort of like cutting out your your soda drinks um and making small tweaks but in terms sure. of starting off with your client um in terms yeah, of more, so, more of the progress mon uh, monitoring in terms of how to how they're going and what sort of assessments you would use and target sure. set well with an obese person um you can generally be a lot more aggressive at least at first in total weight loss mm -hmm. because even fairly small changes in their energy intake and expenditure can give them a pretty big deficit because they are so big, they're burning so many calories already, you know, just taking the stairs and parking farther away from the building every now and then can add up over a week. Um, and again, you know, if you combine that with some dietary changes, you can often lose one or two pounds a week pretty easily. So with obese people, I generally just stick to the you know, one pound per week as a starting goal um, of fat loss. It's reasonable. It's still enough that people feel motivated and happy with their progress. Um, and I generally get them to weigh themselves at least once a week for obese people who are just starting out. That's generally enough. Um, it keeps them from obsessing about it, but it's enough to keep them accountable too. Um, for pretty much everybody, I recommend they write at least write down what they eat every day. Um, for obese people, you generally don't need them to actually count their calories at first or macros. It's just making some qualitative changes. The one exception to that is protein intake. I do think it's important for them to count how much, how many grams of protein they're eating per day, at least at first. And then after they've set up a diet where they know they're getting roughly enough to maintain muscle mass and keep themselves full, then you can, some, in some cases, stop counting that. For physique competitors, which is more of the people I work with, um, goal setting is a little more tricky because when you're getting to very low levels of body fat, it is less predictable how well you're going to lose it, you know, based on trying to maintain your training and just other variables. It's just slower progress, so it's harder to predict. In that case, I always have people weigh themselves every day. Um, that's not really necessary from a measurement perspective, but from an accountability perspective and from a motivational perspective, it's really helpful. Because you wake up every morning, you step on the scale, and you think about that throughout the day. Well, you shouldn't be obsessing about it, but you remember it. It's a reminder. Um, in terms of setting goals, um, in most cases, these people are preparing for a fairly specific event. So you would mark that date on the calendar or you know, figure out whenever it is and work backwards. So you say, okay, you weigh this much now, you need to lose this much fat by the competition or the event or the photo shoot. What is a reasonable rate of progress? How much will you need to eat and exercise or how much weight will you need to lose between where you are now and the competition date? And then what I like to do is set up mini benchmarks. So every two to four weeks, I want you losing this much weight. You know, it might be, in general, that would probably be one to two pounds or maybe two to four pounds every two to four weeks, um, give or take a little bit. Um, and again, that is going to decrease as they get closer to the competition. So in some cases, it might be a third of a pound or half pound per week as they get really, you know, right up to it. Um, 
after that, uh, I like to set calories. It, really, how I set calories depends on the individual. So if it's like an endurance athlete who has very variable energy needs on a day-to-day basis, it's generally, in my opinion, better to kind of add up their normal energy needs without exercise and then add um, exercise on top of that and kind of cycle calories, but it doesn't have to be super precise. So they're eating more on the days they train a whole lot, less on the days they don't. For physique competitors who generally aren't doing a ton of cardio, have lower total energy needs, it's I like to set calories usually based on target body weight. So they figure out how much they'd like to weigh, figure out calories based on that, and that way their deficit gets slightly smaller as they get closer to their competition. So they usually don't have to adjust their diet that much. Um, again, you'll probably have to make some small tweaks in there, but that usually works pretty well. And that's pretty much it. That's pretty much how I set goals. Um, in terms of measuring progress, I use a combination of things. Number one is weight. Number two is the mirror method, just getting them to take pictures of themselves, seeing how they look. Number three would be strength. You know, How are they performing in the gym for physique competitors or power for a cyclist or endurance athlete? And number four would be calipers. Um, people aren't usually very good at measuring calipers. I know I'm not great at it, at least at this point. But you know, it's still a useful thing to have. So I, in general, I'd have them track caliper measurements every one to two weeks. I'd have them weigh themselves every day. I'd have them be, track every single strength workout, every set, every rep. And I would have them take pictures once a week of usually front, back, and sides. So but again, for obese people, tracking progress can usually just be done with weight and maybe taking pictures every two to four weeks. Excellent. Um, that's good because most of the stuff you said I pretty much do as well. So that's a good, that's a good sign. Perfect. <laughs> um, I will also add to the viewers to um, look um, on Army's website in terms of refeeds. He's got a really good podcast on that. So um, definitely check that out. Thanks, Lou. <laughs> okay. Now I'm going on to um, some of, I posted on Facebook and Twitter asking for some questions for yourself. So I'm going to fire some over now. And um, this one again from Daniel, my fellow online coach. Um, Daniel said, there are two theories of why people usually turn to carbohydrate in a sleep deprived or stressed state. These are effort discounting, where people look for a quick hit with minimal effort. Or the second is the brain looks for carbohydrates in general to activate the reward system. So Army, what are your thoughts on that in terms of both for the obese population and the physique competitors? That is a good question. So, um, I guess the the main question is, you know, why are people turning to carbohydrates when they are worn out or sleep deprived or not in a position where they have very high levels of self control? Mm -hmm. um, so, I, I, in general, I would say there are multiple reasons for this, and it's going to depend on the individual to a certain extent. Um, there is some research showing that when you are willpower depleted, um, you are more likely to be, your brain is actually gets a little low on carbohydrate, on glucose. So when you are taking a very demanding test, for example, like an exam, your brain generally uses slightly more glucose. Whether or not that actually is enough to make your body crave it more is kind of up in the air. You know, it's, we're talking about like grams of sugar here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a little skeptical about whether or not that actually translates into wanting to eat a donut or something. But, you know, I, I guess there's a plausible mechanism there. Um, in terms of whether or not the body naturally craves carbs to activate the reward system, that's true, but it also craves, you know, fat and salt and other things that taste good. It's generally just, you know, about palatability in general, not just sugar. But a lot of the things people like are sugary, me included. And me. So, <laughs> yeah, who doesn't, man? <laughs> um, so, and when you look at, you know, so let's say, I guess the third part of that is, you know, availability. Yeah, what's around you. I think that is probably the biggest thing. You know, if you are, you know, like if some starving African person gets a craving for donuts, they're not going to eat a donut because there aren't any donuts for like 2,000 miles. So, uh, I mean, it, I think it largely comes down to that. Um, you can kind of nitpick about, you know, do we naturally crave, crave carbs or fat or sugar, you know, whatever. But it does often just come down to what's around you and whether or not you're hungry. So if you're, you know, you wake up or you're, you know, it's late at night and you're tired, you're sleep deprived, you had a long day and you have a package of Oreos there on the counter, you're probably going to eat some. I mean, you know, unless you have higher levels of self-control than many people. So 
it's a combination of things. Uh, in terms of how to deal with that, I think one of the best ways is to generally consume a diet that's on the lower end of the palatability spectrum. Um, Stefan Guillenet from Whole Health Source has written about this a good bit, the uh, food reward hypothesis. Basically, you know, to vastly oversimplify it, it's that tasty food makes us want to eat more than we really need to maintain our a healthy level of body fat. So just generally eating fairly simple, unprocessed whole foods is a good strategy. But at the same time, like we were just speaking about, letting yourself have some indulgences every now and then so you don't end up just massively craving this stuff and eating a whole box of Oreos instead of three. Um, and then I guess another strategy to help with that would just be to keep these foods generally out of the house or not many in the house or even just out of sight. So if you get, you know, you go to some big department store and you buy a giant box of animal crackers or something, don't just put it there on the counter. You know, maybe fill a baggie with it, leave that out, and then put the other, you know, the box in the basement, something like that. So there's just, you know, out of sight, out of mind is kind of how, like, how I like to think of it. Excellent. Um, so going on to the next question in terms of food rewards, uh, Danny's asked, how would you go about reducing food, uh, food reward in a susceptible individual? Sure. So generally foods that are more rewarding are higher in sugar, fat, salt, and total calories. So reducing your total calorie intake by choosing foods with a lower caloric density is actually a pretty good way to do that just from the beginning. So foods that have a lower reward are generally lower in calories anyway. Uh, you know, an apple versus apple juice, that kind of thing. It's just fewer calories. Choosing foods that are less processed and there isn't a great definition of processed. You know, it's kind of a stupid word, but in general, you know, people kind of get the gist of it. You know, choosing, um, you know, oatmeal versus Lucky Charms, that kind of thing. Um, so choosing foods that are generally more whole, have gone through fewer steps in manufacturing, is another good step. Um, limiting added fats and sugars. Uh, that includes butter. It also includes, you know, sugar in your coffee, that kind of thing. And it doesn't mean eliminating it, just limiting it, so eating less of it. And how much somebody needs to do this is completely dependent on them. Sometimes they just need to cut out a few small things. Like they have cookies every uh, mid-afternoon. They just cut that out. Um, and they're still able to eat everything else they like. In other cases, they might need to be a lot more strict on it. You know, eating something where it's you know largely just meat and vegetables, um, at least for a little while. And again, that's with still, still within the construct of an overall flexible diet. Um, Eating foods that are not combined with other foods, so you know, um, steak and potatoes versus like a thick casserole with all that stuff mixed together, mm -hmm. is generally a good way to reduce the overall reward of your diet. Um, that's because when you combine smells and scents and flavors, it generally becomes tastier. That's why that food tastes really good, uh, and then that encourages overeating. So those are all some good ways to reduce it. Excellent. Some good points there. Um, next question is from Gemma. Uh, what are your opinions on where the lines are between discipline and obsession and a disorder? Mm -hmm. That's a good <laughs> question. Uh, I'm probably not the best person to ask about that, unfortunately. Um, so, you know, a disorder is basically just a collection of normal behaviors that somebody is taking to an extreme to the point where it ends up causing more harm than it does good. And where that lies is often very subjective. Um, if you asked most eating disorder professionals if to look at like the diet of a bodybuilder, they'd probably say they have an eating disorder, like 99% of the time. But these people are still, you know, they still enjoy normal foods. They aren't terrified of them normally. Um, and you know, after the contest, they still eat more, that kind of thing. Uh, and you can almost say that the the, all the things that bodybuilders hate, you know, like food cravings, that kind of stuff, almost proves they don't have an eating disorder. Because they actually, you know, they still want that stuff. Um, so they're kind of healthy to a certain extent. Um, you know, where do you draw the line between discipline and obsession? Um, that's a, you know, I, don't, I don't even think that's an answerable question, unfortunately, even though it's a very good one. For instance, if you look at, you know, professional athletes, these guys like Michael Phelps or Lance Armstrong or whoever, um, they are obviously extremely disciplined, but I don't think you can get to that kind of level without a certain amount of obsession, too. Like Michael Phelps saying he never missed a workout for, you know, like 12 years or something. It's, you know, he's got like you know, 20 more, or over 20 gold medals, but he gave up a lot for that too. And I think that is an obsession to a certain extent. But, you know, it's only possible because of his discipline. And for him, it was a worthy sacrifice. At least, you know, that's what he, I think that's what he thinks. 
um, I, I would generally classify an obsession as something where you're doing it not necessarily because you want to, because but because you feel like you have to. Even if you started out, even if your project started out as something you enjoyed, it becomes something where you feel like you're trapped into it. Um, you know, so if you're like a, trying to get leaner and you know, you're just dieting for months and months, you're just like miserable about it, and you're not even that happy with the results, you're like, you know, maybe this isn't as cool or as amazing as I thought it would be, but you're still just doing it. I would say that's more of an obsession. Discipline, I would say, would be more along the lines of setting reasonable goals, um, you know, kind of self-checking every now and then to make sure that this is actually what you want to do, and then doing it. Um, so, I, I guess that's my best distinction between the two. But again, it's it's hard to tell a lot of times. Yeah, we could. Um, last question. Um, this is from Karen. Uh, which supplements, if any, do you take? Um, and do you believe that food can cover all bases? And why, if you do take them? I think food can cover all bases in most cases. Um, the one supplement I am taking right now is fish oil. And that is not necessarily because I think I'm deficient in it. But there is some evidence that consuming a little extra might be beneficial for certain uh, goals, like uh, body composition or strength increases, for example. Um, but again, I take, I think, one gram per day, so a very small amount. I can generally get the rest from fatty fish, uh, grass-fed meat, meat of any kind, that kind of thing. Um, so I don't think everyone needs to take supplements, but I think there is a place for them in certain contexts. Um, let's see, where's, whey protein, for example, is one that might be beneficial for some people. I can't remember the last time I've had it. I just don't like it very much, and I like milk, but, you know... <laughs> Um, so I'm not dogmatically against them. Uh, I just don't take them any myself. Every now and then I'll take some vitamin K2. I still have a bottle I'm trying to use up. Um, <laughs> but uh, in general, I just get that from butter for the most part, grass-fed butter. Um, but, you know, I'm, and in the middle of the winter, I will take vitamin D sometimes as well. So really the only things I take, the only thing I take regularly is fish oil. The only other things I take intermittently are generally K2 and vitamin D. Um, but yeah, like other than that, um, oh, I guess I should explain why. So in the winter, vitamin D, you generally get less sun exposure. And even when the sun is out, it's not out for as long. And generally there's more cloud cover and, you know, just crap in the way of the sun in your skin. So, you know, it's easier to become vitamin D deficient, but I'm outside enough that I still get a pretty good amount. So I just take a small amount. Vitamin K2, there is some evidence that it might help increase bone mineral density and also help reduce calcification of your arteries, like your coronary arteries. Um, there's still not a ton of evidence on that, which is why I'm kind of hedging on it. Like, yeah, like there are a few studies showing it might be helpful. But I have a bottle, as I said, that I'm trying to use up. So whether or not I buy another one is kind of up in the air. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so I'll take that, like, you know, two or three times a week, um, usually. And then the fish oil, as I said, you know, it has a few advantages, possibly increased insulin sensitivity um, and a few other things like increased uh, muscle growth, possibly. At least it, or it might enhance some of the mechanisms that improve muscle growth. Um, so I think that might be helpful. But yeah, those are the supplements I take, why I take them. And I don't think most people really need to take many supplements, if any. Excellent. Well, um that's some great responses to the questions, Army, so I appreciate your time. Um, before we round up, if you could maybe let the guys where they can uh, keep in contact with you, look at some of your, your work and some of your projects you've got going on at the moment. I know you've got yeah, Chef Labs, which seems cool. <laughs> uh, thank you, man. <laughs> yeah, so I have two main projects right now. Um, the hub of everything is improvism.com. That's I-M-P-R-U-V-I-S-M.com. That's where I write about you know most of the health stuff, and you can find links to the app that I'm making for personal trainers to track their fitness, which is Improver. And my other major project is Chef Labs, which teaches you how to become an independent chef. So if you want to, you can can prepare all of your own meals, and that is ChefLabs.com. S C H E F no C H E F L A B Z dot com. I can't fucking spell. So. <laughs> That's right. I'll put all the links uh, in the Perfect feed anyway, enough. so don't worry. Thanks, dude. Okay. Thanks for your time, Army. No, thank you, man. It was a pleasure talking to you. Excellent. Cheers. Speak soon. All right. See you, man. Bye.